Not exactly sure how to work this thing. It's October 2015. This, this is going to be a continuation of what uh, is considered book one oh. so therefore this is the contents of book two in video format instead of written For those of you um, listening on this date, you're few, and you may or may not know about Albert's writings. Silhouette of her body, but specifically her head, 
struck me for a moment. The lines of her body were as artful and delicate as always, but her head made me shudder. I thought it was her updo, but the shadow lines indicated her hair was down. It was draped on her shoulders, yet the bulge was still there. A bulge atop her head that I'd never noticed before. I wanted to see clearly, to understand, to know for sure. Closely, I nudged the door open so I could see her in clear light. At that very instant, her hands were gathering her hair to pull it up on top. Just a split second, a fraction of an instant, before she raised it up, I saw it very clearly. The bump on her skull. It was there. It was real. She knew the time would come. Robert had already heard of Seti. The conversation began as we warmed up to play a game of three-person cutthroat. Oh yeah, I know about them. They've used advanced parabolic tissues to send out radio signals, stated Robert. They sent a message back in 1974. A message to whom? I ignorantly replied as I put the ball in play. Any intelligent race that is out there in the universe, anybody who is listening, Robert wiggled his fingers in my direction, trying to be spooky. His efforts failed miserably, so he stopped. Allie chimed in. If there were a reply, I'm sure everybody would know about it. That would be huge news across the globe. But I seriously doubt there's any life out there as advanced as us. As she placed her wet clothes on the drying rack, she was tossing them briefly in the air. While directing a vocal tone, she made the clothing float, one garment at a time. She'd suspend them for a moment in an artistic dance. It was beautiful, Mama. She'd toss a blouse lightly in the air, and like a momentary parachute, the fabric would form a billowing curve and capture the space below it. She did this as she hummed, effortlessly. It was sensational and awesome. I turned and walked back down the hall, pausing at her sketches. I couldn't believe it. James' designs were the same as the crop circles. What was happening within her during the meditation that preceded her sketches? I woke up at 3.11 a.m., again drenched in sweat. The dream is definitely back, recurring again, but more is starting to happen. I'm writing this as fast as I can so none of it is forgotten. But what surprised me the most is that Dad's silicon alien story became part of it. As the heat enveloped me while going through the gate, I didn't wake up yet. Approaching the first stepping stone in the smoldering lake, just before extending my leg, something unexpected happened. I looked back at the fence, wondering if it might be possible to go back to the fork in the road to take the steep and curvy path, but woke in terror upon seeing a small gray alien, like Dad described, standing in the gateway. With her breathing constant and maintaining a high-frequency motion, the air around her seemed to begin morphing. There appeared to be a warping of space all around her. I could see it at the coffee table next to her. The straight edge of the table now had a slight curve in it. Her vibrations became increasingly rapid, yet hardly noticeable to the naked eye. The lens-like curvature of visual space around her increased in angle, and the arc curves enhanced, becoming increasingly pronounced. As her vibrations peaked to a new, higher resonant frequency, a rattling sound emerged, possibly of the windows or entire wooden structure of the small house. In a burst of light, the curvature of space around her doubled in concentric circles, like ripples on the surface of a pond. Light emitted from the center, aligned with her heart center, and she began to levitate. My hand reactively released its grip on the ball as I continued oming the tone, curious to push the power further. The tone's echo was pure and beautiful. The tingling sensation was a splendid accompaniment to the sonic phenomenon. I stopped vocalizing in anticipation of the echo that would continue briefly thereafter. What had happened? Was it that time had slowed down in the volume around me? It didn't seem like it. Then it dawned on me. The ball was in my tingling hand when I released.
waste it. My God, time didn't stand still, the ball did. I knew in my heart at that moment it was true. Somehow, between the tingles and sonics, the vibrations in my hand held power over the ball. Even though I had released it, it remained by my hand. A warm rush flooded throughout my body as I realized the truth. I had discovered the gift of levitation. The snake continued up my spine, illuminating brightly each chakra as it passed. The cascading, flickering lights continued in a rhythmic pattern, becoming more stable and pronounced. Visions of double helix DNA strands illuminated my spine, flickering towards my neck as they continued up my vertebrae. Life was in my spine. Secret chambers were unlocking. The crackling sounds that accompanied the flickering were now coupled with visions of DNA strands snapping together. The thunderous timpani echoed as the symphonic crescendo continued. Shivers were ever present with simultaneous harmonic joy. Illuminated crackling past my neck as chains in my foaming tone rang pure like a tuning fork. Resonant vibrations enveloped the space around us and I felt no sense of gravity. Jane smiled and reached her hand slowly toward the baby, her other hand still holding mine. With a sweeping motion of her thumb, Jane caressed the baby's forehead. The sunlight reflected brightly off her golden cuff bracelet. Tingles erupted in my hand that held hers and flowed through my body. Jane was giving the baby some of her energy, some of her magic. Encapsulated light radiated from the stroller. And suddenly a flash flowed up toward the sky. The look in its eyes was different. The disorder seemed to vanish. It was a shocking miracle. Jane used her power to reconstruct the child's DNA. The mother looked down, quickly shifted to the front, leaned close to her baby, and burst out in tears. Crying in blessed joy, she turned to embrace Jane, then reached for her baby. Jane began. Who created yours, this guarded memory that you protect, now that you've exposed my secret? Her admission left the room in dead silence. She and Dad looked eye to eye, unblinking. Mom had no idea what was going on. His gaze scanned to our hands. He peered towards me, head wobbling, and set the glass down, drunkenly crossing the classified threshold to a degree like never before, he mumbled. Agent Silicone 7. His fingers touching the painted egg on the table. He sputted in a daze briefly before quickly looking at me as though about to say something. And then he quieted down. I understood at that moment that Dad knew more about the artificial intelligence beings that pilot the egg-like surveillance crafts. Stillness eclipsed the space as I remembered a moment in my dream. Greeting her, I stated, Hello, Savannah. My name is Albert. If your competitor does not show up, will you accept me as challenger? I outstretched my hand to shake hers. Gracefully, Sadana grinned and reached her hand towards mine. Happily, she replied simply. Our hands came together and a burst of tingles erupted through my fingers. Her eyes widened and then narrowed. Clearly, she sensed the tingling too. And as our grips tightened a little, shivers traveled up my arm to my neck and head. We released hands and she glanced at Jane, her gaze shifting from Jane's eyes to her up to and back to her eyes. I turned to another bench and placed my gear bag upon it. Jane went to the official to inform him of the development. What's the challenger's name? I call it Azahel. It was Aramaic. I referred to an unnamed king. As my eyes adjusted, the quantity of metal orbs increased, circling ever faster around the cloud which began to dissipate. Water was falling from the dissipating cloud, which faded in swirling wisps to reveal an enormous craft, the most remarkable spaceship I could have ever imagined. Glorious and beautiful, perhaps a half mile wide. It was dripping water all around us, and a drop landed on my lips. The taste was familiar. It was salt water. In utter disbelief, I looked at Jane. In that moment, I knew it was water from the Atlantic Ocean. The ship had traveled through a wormhole and made its presence known for all to see. Jane was already looking into my eyes. Her beauty was breathtaking. Softly and sincerely, she said, Albert, my love, 
I'd like you to meet my father. Just pretend he's... She paused and shifted my palms to her belly. One of the family. As you can imagine, I was dumbfounded when I learned what Albert experienced. Through his writings, along with what I already discovered, I'm beginning to see the bigger picture and what it means to be human. There are many things that must be reconciled. For now, we reconcile Albert.